I want to acknowledge our university and community supporters. The University of Iowa's international programs and the University of Iowa's honors program, they contribute vital time, talent, and logistics to our organization. I'm also uh, very grateful to the Stanley U of I Foundation support organization for their ongoing financial support. And I thank today's special financial sponsors, David D Denise and Mike Tiffany, and Hayek Brown, Moreland and Smith, LLP. Our programs, of course, are only made possible by the financial support of these sponsors. Before I begin my introduction of today's speakers, uh, I want to uh, also acknowledge the loss that the Foreign Relations Council uh, feels um, with the passing of uh, a very generous supporter and member of the Iowa City Foreign Relations Council, uh, Burns Weston. Burns was a prominent legal scholar, a prolific author, a sought-after lecturer um, and uh, a real contributor to the intellectual life and the, the international focus of our university. Uh, he was devoted to the issues of international human rights and sustainability and we're going to miss Burns and we're indeed grateful uh, for the wisdom that he shared with us. So let me turn to introducing our speaker today, my friend Lieutenant Colonel James D. Fielder. Uh, as I mentioned, he's currently the Division Chief at, for Analysis, Assessments, and Lessons Learned at the 25th U.S. Air Force Base Headquarters in Lackland, Texas. Uh, he enlisted in the U.S. Army in 1994 as a Persian linguist and electronic warfare specialist. Following his honorable discharge from the Army in 1999, he decided to move up uh, by joining the U.S. Air Force. Uh, I guess you would say that now, right? And uh, he joined the U.S. Uh, Air Force Officer Training School. Uh, from 2006 to 2009, he was an assistant professor of political science at the U.S. Air Force Academy. He was subsequently sponsored for an Air Force-funded Ph.D. program in political science here at the University of Iowa, which is where I got to know him. And this opportunity allowed him to pursue his Ph.D., uh, but within a total of only three years to go from start to finish. Uh, now, I can tell you that no one else in my time here in the department uh, over three decades has gone through a doctoral program in political science in only three years. Even to finish up in four years is kind of a sprint. Five to six years is not all that uh, rare. And so uh, it's not just about taking the courses, uh, too, but it's about doing well in the courses. Uh, our department, uh, you know, is willing to... Um, to tell people they should pursue other uh, opportunities in life if they're not handling the coursework well. So um, uh, it's pretty uh, amazing that he was able to do that uh, for us. And, and if you're imagining yourself uh, that he did it in uh, some monastic uh, form of uh, you know n no social life, no family life, uh, I, I should tell you that uh, he's married with two children who were teenagers at the time, and uh, he still managed to do all this. So uh, really quite remarkable. Uh, he. Uh, succeeded in completing and defending a very nice uh, dissertation in 2012. He then, um, not so long after that, he uh, volunteered for a tour of duty in Afghanistan. He served as the 438th Air Expeditionary Advisory Group's Senior Intelligence Officer and advisor to the Afghan Air Force Air Wing. Uh, while uh, for his performance there, he was awarded the Bronze Star Medal for meritorious achievements in operations against an opposing armed force. And beginning next academic year, uh, he will return to the U.S. Air Force Academy to teach political science. So please join me in welcoming Lieutenant Colonel James Fielder.
That was an interesting day for me. <laughs> yes. So I got that off of CNN. I also had the opportunity to live that in person. Um, I got to say, that was the first time in my career, and I've been in 21 years. I guess it was a little under 20 at that point that I actually heard bullets coming towards me. Not a very pleasant experience, but that's okay. I had my trusty coffee mug with me, and that's a source of all my power. Um, <laughs> thankfully, no Afghan uh, forces or uh, NATO forces were killed or injured in this. And not that I want to uh, glorify any sort of death, but the insurgents in question were killed in the attack. One of my uh, partners uh, in the security forces was awarded the Bronze Star for Valor because he actually advanced towards the fire and was credited with killing one of the insurgents himself. Um, so this puts in perspective, it's not just applying theory that I learned here, but trying to learn how to use it under very trying conditions. With that, I want to thank you for having me here. I'm hoping to meet two goals with you today while I'm speaking. First is to provide you a talk that's an informative informative and engaging, and I've already met my second goal, which is video proof that I can eat an Italian meal without spilling anything on my shirt. <laughs> so, so yes, I'm currently at the uh, 25th Air Force down at Lackland Air Force Base, Texas. I, I love my job there, work some, with some very, very uh, smart individuals, and they seem to tolerate me uh, fairly well. But I'm not going to be talking about today. What I'll be focused on is Afghanistan. My time there, and I'm going to tell how I use political science through two stories, a story of political communication, a story of voting behavior, which I'll link together with a theme of Afghan culture. I do want to add, though, that I wouldn't say that I volunteered for Afghanistan. It's more that the Air Force offered me an opportunity that I couldn't refuse. <laughs> um, I will say, I, I certainly don't want to repeat the process, but I don't regret having done it. It was a very rewarding experience, although a little hairy at times. So what did I do? I was dual-hatted, and uh, Dr. Reisinger already alluded this, to this in that my first goal was to serve as the senior intelligence officer to uh, the U.S. colonel for the 438th Air Expeditionary Advisory Group, where I basically provided information on what the threats were to our own forces, both Afghan Air Force and NATO forces stationed throughout Kabul, so traditional intelligence work. Second goal was to advise Afghan um, Air Force. In particular, I was there to support development of the Airborne Intelligence, Surveillance, and Reconnaissance Program, or ISR for short. Now, no I was there to advise one guy, the, the Kabul Air Wing Director of Intelligence, an Afghan Lieutenant Colonel. However, in reality, day-to-day -day operations, I advised about 14 junior Afghan personnel ranging from a major to uh, several privates and teaching them traditional intelligence tradecraft. And we did a variety of missions throughout Afghanistan. Again, we were focused on airborne operations, uh, a mix of actual airfield assessments. By that, I mean actually going to check out um, older airfields to see if they'd be suitable for reconstruction or for Afghan Air Force use, and also some operational missions. We were actually trying to find uh, members of the Taliban or the Haqqani network or Al-Qaeda or other uh, insurgents groups throughout, largely um, eastern Afghanistan and to the north. With that, now I'll open up with our first goal. This goal, again, was to how do I advance Afghan Air Force's uh, ability to prosecute their mission, and this is be my, my story of political culture. And just as a side note, this picture on the left is an example of some of our work cleared by public affairs, just showing an analysis of fields of fire from an uh, outpost. And I, I kid you not, the picture on the right, not a stage picture. We were actually standing just like that when someone took a photograph. <clears throat> so political communication. Now, I did test in IR, international relations and comparative politics, while I was in the University of Iowa. But towards the end of my term there, I uh, grew a greater fondness for political communication. Um, in particular, I'm a very huge fan of the Shannon Weaver model, model. And even more specifically, what I'm particularly interested in is noise. The noise that prevents a signal that re going from the information source or transmitter all the way to the receiver and back. And the, the original model just so it shows noise pointing at a particular channel, but I perceive it as noise happening at any point in the communications process. Now, from an Afghan perspective, and living in a, a foreign country, working with a foreign culture, this noise could range anywhere from language differences to ethnic differences to even just technological limitations or 
the concept of time, i.e., the NATO or American uh, process of being one, being in a hurry to do everything right away, and the Afghan process is, no, let's take our time and get to know each other. By learning to work with their technical limitations and their cultural factors, you can communicate a lot more effectively. But I'm going to hold that thought for a second because, first, I want to describe the physical terrain, and this is because it ties in more to the technolo technological limitations of their communications. As you can see, it's a very, um, very rough terrain up to the north and east, uh, dominated by the Hindu Kush mountains. Uh, down south around Kandahar, uh, flat plains, but desert, very high winds and very hot in uh, the summer. Uh, co combined together, it made for difficult flying, particularly for um, the um, Afghan C-208 aircraft. They had difficulty going over some of the mountain ranges. And if you get a high crosswinds, difficult difficulty landing, although I had, did have some pilots talk about landing in some fairly hairy conditions. So you can see it's a very, very rugged, remote uh, location. And put it in perspective, so I'm unfortunately stationed in Texas right now. Don't get me out. I love my job, but I don't like San Antonio. <laughs> and I just got that on film. I'm sorry, San Antonio. Um, <laughs> but I've been in parts of Texas and also, you know, Wyoming and whatnot, where it's very remote. And you're looking across the highway and you see houses out in the middle of nowhere. And you're like, well, how do they get their groceries and their gas and whatnot? But now I'm flying over parts of Afghanistan. There's nothing. And you look down and you see houses. Like, there's no roads. What do they do? So it's very, very rugged. Very, and the individuals out here are probably just as rugged as the terrain that surrounds them. And with that, the, with talking about the people, now we can talk about the ethnic terrain. Um, not only just very geographically challenging, but also challenging from a sense of religion, ethnic, and language differences. Uh, dominated by Islam and the two predominant denominations being Sunni and Shia. Um, languages uh, dominated by Dari and Pashto. Advantage I had, I had gotten quite rusty in Farsi by the time I deployed here, quite rusty. But Dari and Farsi are close enough in dialect that I was able to pick it up back again and have some conversations with Afghans and not stick my foot in my mouth too much. Um, literacy, though, is still pretty low. Education, is there's a big push for education in Afghanistan. As you can see, um, for men it's low, but for women it's catastrophically low, which could be a problem uh, long term for uh, educational, economic, and cultural development. And ethnic groups uh, dominated by Pashtuns and Tajiks. I largely work with Tajiks. The Afghan Air Force is made up mostly of Tajiks, uh, Dari speakers, and whatnot. I had very little opportunity to work with any Pashtuns, and I didn't. I can't say I even heard Pashtuns spoken the entire time I was there. I only heard Dari. But even so, if you look at this and you look at the map, uh, hopefully the colors aren't too bad from your perspective, but say that Tajiks and Hazara are dominant uh, north and then towards the south will be the Pashtuns, although there are enclaves uh, throughout. Uh, I want to make a special note for Hazara and that not only are they a minority compared to the Tajiks and the Pashtuns, but they're also predominantly Shia. So they're beaten up on all fronts. And the reason they're in that location in the central highlands is historically they were given the less fertile land because they were seen as you know, lesser than their Sunni or Pashtun or Tajik brothers. So now, as you can see here, this is a very strong mix for potential ethnic conflict, and trust me, that ethnic conflict is there. <coughs> so, now going back to combining technological and cultural, nothing specific about this except to show that the U.S. military is very technologically sophisticated. I mean, we had Afghanistan saturated with communications. If I want to talk to anybody, I could grab anything, and I'd, you know, I had pigeons and wires and and phones and radios and, and communicating, communicating through aircraft and ground stations and you name it. But we also had a very um, strong um, hierarchy and our hierarchy could function with very little trust, i.e. if uh, General Reisinger passed down an order to my commander to come to me, I would just assume General Reisinger knew what he was talking about, I would carry about my orders to the best of my ability, no question. Now contrast that with Afghanistan in general, here's their communication system. I kid you not, in my experience working in the Afghan Air Force, almost everything was done over cell phones and handheld radios. And it's amazing what you could, you could do with those things. Now, I never want to hear the name Roshan Network in my life ever again, but if you wanted anything done, you had to learn how to use their technological systems, which are very limited. But also, their hierarchy is different. The uh, young lieutenant colonel who did not know General Habib Reisinger 
might say, well, I don't really know that general that well. Now, it wouldn't be open mutiny or whatnot, but it'd be, he might be a little more hesitant because that trust wasn't there. So you see a lot of individuals put in positions where they have family uh, relationships, clan relationships, religious relationships, because that helps build that social network. So not only did I have to learn how to use their technical systems, but I also had to learn how to use their cultural systems. A lot, I drank tea by the gallon, ate lots of goat, and I gotta tell you, if you ever have a chance to have Afghan food, it is out of this world good, out of this world good. Um, but I would literally spend most of my time building capital, social capital with my, my friends there. So some days teaching my Afghans traditional Intel tradecraft could be no kidding, let's read maps and charts and do visual recognition to let's just sit here and watch Bollywood mo movies together all day because so we can build trust, and a lot of it was about building trust. And along trust is patience, going back to time. Patience is something that's in very short supply in American culture. If you don't have that, if you don't have a well of it inside of you, you're not gonna function well in this culture. Now, I like to think of myself as, a, a, despite all of, his, of Dr. Reisinger's kind words, I'm fundamentally kind of a lazy, happy-and-go-lucky B type. So I could sit and just sit there and watch movies all day with them and, be per and drink tea and be perfectly happy. That made me a little more amiable to work in this situation. But you have a very um, strict A-type, very aggressive personnel that I could see them get very frustrated with the processes there. Now, how do we bring this all together? Well, unfortunately, on May 2nd, 2014, there was a catastrophic mudslide in Badakhshan province uh, up north that killed 2,500 Afghan villagers uh, left thousands more homeless. Now, before that, if you want to do an imagery mission, an uh, airborne ISR mission, it could take you know, just a week to get the approval process to do it because the Afghans like their paperwork and it's all literally paperwork, getting it stamped, signed, approved. Oh, I don't know who you are, so I'm going to sit on this until we've established trust. Oh, I'll you know, put this to the side. Well, in this case, it happened. And I walked into the Afghan colonel's office and said, Colonel, I got an idea. Let's just make some calls and let's get an aircraft up there and get some photographs of this so we can start to do, get some humanitarian aid to the, to the area. And there was a long pause and he chewed on a cigarette and he looked at me and said, Major Kabatar, that's Pigeon and Dari, I got a great idea. How about we make some calls and we fly up there and we take some pictures? And I said, Colonel, I'm glad you thought of that. <laughs> and Forget all the paperwork. He literally, you, watching the Afghan network in action, in action. we'd established a trust, we'd established a network, we had established a rapport. He gets out his cell phone. Hey, uh, Colonel Abdul, we want to fly up there and take some pictures. Uh, yeah, we'll be there um, tomorrow. Oh, you need a C-130? What do you want in it? Okay, I can get that. Oh, you want the second vice president of Afghanistan to know about this? Yeah, I'll give him a call too. Done, let's go. Next day, we piled an aircraft and what? Even traditionally, just to do the airborne mission, to fly, come back, process it, and distribute it took four days, we reduced it to seven hours. From time of takeoff to coming back and getting it out to authorities, we were able to get uh, construction equipment, medical supplies, food, um, public affairs, you name it, up to the area, which was a huge, huge uh, relations coup for the uh, Afghan Air Force. And from a humanitarian um, perspective, it warms my heart to see that we actually use this to get the right gear and right uh, foodstuffs and whatnot up to these Afghans to help them out. So again, culture and communication in action. I will remember this for the rest of my life. Oh, side note. I can't identify him by name, but the bottom right corner that was my non-commissioned officer in charge. Uh, if you haven't been in the military, he's like my general manager. He uh, was the only person, when we got on the C-130 and flew up there, he was the only person in the group certified to drive a forklift because he was a prior electrician before he became Intel, so he knew a lot of sophisticated construction work. So for two days, he got to go up there and drive a, drive a forklift around. So I'm without my sergeant, but I'm like, you know what? He's happy, and even though I felt like a little bit less of a man for those two days, you know, good on him. Good on him. Great, great guy, great guy. So now I can talk about the second goal, and this was how do I maintain awareness of threats to our personnel in Kabul, both NATO and Afghan Air Forces? And this is where we talk about the election year of 2014. Big year, 
not just an Afghan presidential election, but it is the first election in modern Afghan history where it's two new competitors. The incumbent, Hamid Karzai, was going out of office. He reaches term limits. So now we got to see a real political battle between two sides. And when I say political battle, it's not like Donald Trump acting crazy on CNN in our own culture. It literally could be a political battle with people dying in the streets. Therefore, my colonel comes up to me and says, Pigeon, I need to know anything you know about Afghan politics, voting behavior, and how this election is going to work, and I need to know what our threats are here. Disclosure, voting behavior is not one of my strong suits. I took the required course for my core requirements, never thinking to ever use it again. That thought did not matter at this point when the colonel is asking for help. Therefore, I just started pulling books and papers off the shelf, which would be, if I, if I know correctly, is known as abductive reasoning, basically using whatever data I have on hand to try to make a, a, a decision. Um, well, I, sh I want to describe then the differences between parliamentary uh, elections and presidential elections here, because even though it's, the focus is on presidential elections, it's important to note um, the uh, crucial differences compared to another, like a, another parliamentary system in, say, Britain or Canada. So parliament in Afghanistan is like you would see in another um, multi-constituency uh, area like Britain, where it'll say, okay, you have this many candidates, this many will be allowed to take office, therefore these top four are in office. So how that's useful in an area like Afghanistan, where there's a lot of potential ethnic and cultural conflict <coughs> potentials, is while likely the largest ethnic group, the Pashtuns, will have the balance of individuals in parliament, at least gives a higher probability that there will be seats at the table for all the other ethnic groups. So all the other ethnic groups get a voice, and that's a very important. But unlike other parliamentary systems, there's not a prime minister. Now it's, their president is elected similar to ours, two people running against each other. Whoever gets 50.1% of the vote, okay, they don't have electoral college system, but anyway, the majority vote becomes president. What's different though is unlike when we have our basically two candidates vying over the next year or so to, uh, for the election, they will have the initial election where they'll have maybe 10 or 14 people running, which makes it very mathematically impossible for a single person to get the uh, majority vote. Then they'll have a runoff where the top two candidates will then run. Well, looking at this, I said, you know what? This sort of makes me think of the median voter theorem, which dates back to hoteling in 1929 and has been applied in various other academic papers. The three I've studied here are just a small, small representation of studies of medium voter theorem. And this is traditionally applied to when you have two people voting against each other. What this says, if you have a left to right voting spectrum, we could say Democrat, Republican, liberal, um, conservative, you name it. The person who's going to win an election is not the candidate who appeals to the fringe left or the fringe right. It's going to be the candidate who can appeal to the moderate. The person who gets the same cornflakes in the cereal aisle every day, he, he, or he or she reliably orders a latte at Starbucks in the morning going to work, they don't really have any serious, seriously strong feelings about political policies. Um, but they feel comfortable about where they stand. If whoever gets those people in the center, that's who's going to win. So I looked at this, this model, and I said, I think I see this model working in Afghanistan, but from a ethnic standpoint, which would look like this. Going into the first round, there were, there were actually 11 candidates, but one, uh, Hamid Karzai's brother dropped out about halfway through the race, leaving nine Pashtun candidates, Pashtuns. Of all the other ethnic groups, it was all Pashtuns and one Tajik. So going into the first round, we went to the colonel and said, sir, based on previous elections and based on the, vote, the, um, the number of people running, no one is going to win the majority. The Tajik, Dr. Abdul Abdullah, might come close, but he's not going to get it. It's just we, we think that all the Pashtuns are going to vote for their local Pashtun candidate, which is going to divide the vote. 
all the Tajiks and probably the Hazars are going to come out and vote for Abdullah Abdullah, but he won't have, the, there just won't be the constituency there to put him in, get him into office. So this first round, we did assess that likely the, the Pashtuns would go, they were going to vote for their local candidate. Like, oh, this guy lives down the street. He's part of my clan, part of my family. Um, I know him and it, un, all hymns, unfortunately. We, um, therefore, I, I, since I feel comfortable with this individual, I'll vote for them, and which is how it worked. So the first round, and I must apologize for the colors here. The, uh, the program here made the colors for me, and I couldn't alter them. And it would take me like years probably to try to do it myself. But I think this display is a pretty good uh, capture where you can see Abdullah largely in the north and the center taking the Tajik vote, and Ghani and the other all Pashtun again taking the Pashtun's vote with some enclaves in other ethnic areas. Abdullah came close, similar to the 2009 election, but no cigar. What we got was the top three candidates. I know it's, a, it's the um, runoff between two candidates, but I will say we, we knew it was going to be one of these three individuals based on uh, polls and previous results, although Ghani only got 3% of the vote in 2009, so he had a huge upswell this time around. From my Western perspective and my own understanding of these candidates, I was very happy with all three, all very well educated. Uh, they've done international positions, local politics, um, all great uh, candidates for Afghanistan. The only reason I highlighted the um, Dr. Zalman Rasul at the end, what made him unusual is that he made it this far as an unmarried man in Afghanistan with no kids, which is culturally very, very unusual. Uh, if you're an unmarried man in Afghanistan, you're seen as still like a boy. So he still had a very strong ground solo support. Um, so for the second round, knowing it was going to be Ghani and Abdullah, my team said, this time, the Tajik is going to win. I'm sorry, the Pashtun is going to win, excuse me, because all the Pashtun voters are going to say, well, my candidate has dropped out. I don't want the Tajik to win. Therefore, I'm going to vote for the Pashtun. I don't care who he is. And that's exactly what happened. And the results were almost identical, Ghani being the Pashtun and Abdullah being the Tajik. The results are almost identical to the 2009 outcome between Abdullah and Karzai. Oh, I do want to point out that Dr. Abdullah Abdullah is both Tajik and Pashtun, but he identifies publicly as Tajik. So he, he purposely appeals to Tajik voters, and he doesn't really campaign on a Pashtun platform. So what is, compare, oh yeah, to compare to 2009, again, again, apologies for the colors here. So there are differences. 2009. Karzai, the Pashtun, cleaned up the Pashtun vote. 2014, Ghani, the Pashtun, cleaned up the Pashtun vote. What does this mean? Politically, is as long as there is an ethnic or cultural component in Afghan politics, the Pashtun candidate will always win the presidency. For the long-term health of Afghanistan, I do know that the Tajiks are getting a little miffed. And I know Abdullah Abdullah was hopping mad when this all went down. I don't know if you remember the brouhaha between him and Ghani um, be between the first election and the runoff. And the Hazars are definitely tired of getting always beat up. And they're like, we'll never get a voice at the table, which could lead to violence, which leads to my next slide. What does this mean operationally? Well, in the 2009 presidential election, hundreds of Afghans were killed throughout Afghanistan in political violence. In this case, assessing that the Pashtun was going to win, the Tajik was going to come in second place, and the Hazars was going to be mad because they didn't stand a chance, what we were able to do is we were able to go to my commander and say, sir, we recommend avoiding travel to up to the election and after for both rounds. In the Pashtun areas, they're going to be celebrating, but you could get isolated. Tajik areas are going to be mad, so you can get caught up in violence, and the same with Hazar areas. So. Basically, we took the theory, medium voter theory, to both forecast the outcome of the election and also prevent NATO and Afghan troops from actually getting injured or killed, and we had no security losses over the period. Unfortunately, 48 Afghans were killed throughout Afghanistan. Now, I want to put in that context. 48 doesn't sound like that many, especially compared to 2009. Now, imagine our own country if a 
gentleman on CNN or a lady on CNN got up and said, we had a great election year this year. Only 48 Americans were killed in electoral violence, which for me puts it into great perspective of what we're dealing here. Now, unfortunately, I, uh, I do know that there's still ongoing tensions in the Afghan government. The good news would be, my you can correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is Ghani and Abdullah do not personally dislike each other. Um, their disagreements are all just about um, political, like policy differences or that ongoing, Abdullah's ongoing anger that mathematically I'm not going to win, but they don't personally dislike each other. And Ghani did invite him to join his uh, government. He said, I will be president, you can be my pseudo prime minister, and we can try to work together. But they're having difficulty coming to, to, um, to collaboration on appointing ministers. They still don't have a minister of defense. Uh, reading the news, they say the, uh, the ongoing joke in the Afghan government is the de facto minister of defense is General Campbell, a US Army general stationed in Afghanistan. Um, this ties into the, to the next slide, my final slide, and you think about security. Now, I was only there for a year. If you look at all those together, again, this is a story about communication, about behavior, and ultimately about culture. But talking about my perspective about just being there for a year, speaking just as myself, not as a representative of the US Air Force, but as Pigeon, as, as Jim Fielder, I am actually happy that Obama, President Obama, excuse me, um, said we should probably leave forces there because this is going to be a long, overcoming these type of cultural tes tensions and security problems is going to be a long-term effort. And unfortunately, do we want to stay there as a culture? Probably not. Do we want Afghanistan to fall back into a fetid wasteland again? Do we want ISIS to rise up? Um, from an intelligence perspective, there's few, there are a few things worse than a failed state. And I certainly don't want to see it happen. Unfortunately, there's um, this is a long-term problem. But you know, uh, the, the, anyone here watch Doctor Who? You know, you have that one guy who dies periodically and gets reborn. Imagine like 400 or 500 Americans leaving every year and being replaced. So that it's always encouraging that oh, we got a new doctor. What's he like? So you're constantly having to reinvent the wheel, get to know processes. Um, it encourages a very narrow-minded sense of how do we solve this problem in the year that I'm going to be here. Forget what happens after that. I would say most of us are very, very good about thinking long-term, like what do I leave my, 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 um, the person who comes after me to do and hope that they do it. But ultimately, when you're in a situation that I know I can leave, and as my Afghans say, you're going to leave, we're still going to be here, and now we have to get to know someone else. That it's hard to build trust that way. In addition, if you're going to over, if we're going to solve these these issues, ongoing security issues in Afghanistan, it's very important to think like an Afghan, not like an American. Now, this I would say applies to any culture that we work with in the world, and it's probably a very difficult lesson for us to uh, to learn as Americans or even NATO countries. But if you're going to do anything, if you want to try to use well, I don't want to say use their culture in a sense of, of um, consuming it, but applying it, working with them, become one of them. You will never be truly like them. But to put in perspective, I had an opportunity to brief the entire Afghan Air Force intelligence staff, entire staff, all like 900 of them. They all came to Kabul to give a, to give a talk, and they said, hey, we'll have Pigeon get up there and and talk about uh, communications processes, I made sure to open my remarks entirely in Dari. And that immediately established rapport that had them leaning in their seats. And by the time I said, I got to proceed in English now because my next portions of my briefing are too technical, that I, I don't want to mess it up. I went to my translator, but they ate it up because I was willing to try. That's what it comes down to. After that, working, uh, knowing their behavior, knowing their culture, knowing their technical limitations, if you can find ways to establish rapport and trust, not just with the Afghans, but with anyone we work with, if you can find a way to create social capital about all, without all the noise that exists, then you're going to affect change. And I like to think, think I made a small difference while I was there. Um, but unfortunately, I read my optimism is a little tarnished by reading a, an article just this morning in the New York Times. 
if anyone had a chance to read it, about um, Afghans leaving Kabul for because of jobs drying up and security concerns. What it comes down to, I know there's some, we might have, did anyone, actually, I should say, did anyone hear my, I had an opportunity to be on the radio yesterday. Did anyone hear that? No? Okay, that's probably for the best. Um, <coughs> there, we have, I'd say culture, we have some mis misconceptions about the Af Afghan people. Uh, one, lumping, saying they're all Afghans, because they tend to identify themselves as Tajiks or Baluchis or Uzbeks first, and then Afghans. But they're, they're, a war -like, they're, they're honorable, they're a warrior culture, they'll stand with it for they believe in, they will work hard, they are not lazy, and they're not all supporters of the Taliban. What they do want are the same things that we want, which is, can I raise my family safely? Can, I, can my kids go to school? Can I not be oppressed because of my religious beliefs? And that's enshrined in their constitution. So I read that article in the New York Times today and see that the sense of security is not there. Long term, when you see the, the, the recent resurgence of the Taliban, it's not necessarily that they support the Taliban because of their beliefs. They support them because they give me security that doesn't exist. My Tajik friends are afraid they don't want us to leave. And they remember what it was like, some of my older folks I work with remember what it was like under the Soviets. They remember what the Civil War was like in the 90s. They remember what the first Taliban was like. They don't want to go back to that. But as we're pulling out, security is getting smaller. They see it happening again. I still remain optimistic, though, that if we can, t if we can stay tapped into their mindset, their culture, and learn to work like they do, and we stay there, then there is hope. And I'll make, leave a final note, which would be my last bullet there. There is a, a um, I don't want to say division, it's not the right word, but there is, I guess, a debate within political science about how do you apply political science theory? Do you want to use it positively or normatively? By positively, I mean facts for facts sake. I'm, I'm, I'm investing my intellectual capital, under, capital to understand a problem but not necessarily going to use it uh, to affect change, which is fine. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that position because you want to be able to pursue knowledge without necessarily having constraints. But also this, using political science normatively. I tried to use it, what I learned at University of Iowa, to affect change in Afghanistan. I like to think I was successful. But there have been examples in U.S. history where political science has been used for purposes that was not intended to be used, i.e. realism theory, Hans Morgenthau's realism used during the 60s under the Kennedy and Johnson um, administrations to actually prosecute the Vietnam War to um, <clears throat> not the most successful results. And Hans Morgenthau was not very happy about that. But I'd like to remain optimist and uh, I, I remain happy about applying this normatively. And I still remain optimist that we will see a future for Afghanistan and they will, they will be strong one day. And I hope, I just hope, I'll put it that way. With that, this concludes my briefing. Well, since uh, I can ask this very uh, quickly and, and uh, look through the other questions uh, while it's being answered, I'll just uh, uh, begin with uh, the question of what can you say about uh, issues of corruption in Afghanistan? Terrible. Terrible. Um, I hate to say it. Um, I've s Again, I, speaking as me, I mean, it's hard to hide that behind the identity of the Air Force here. I did see evidence of um, excess bureaucracy used probably to hide the transfer of, of money, uh, misappropriation of equipment, um, resources going down black holes. That, in fact, I would probably say you have security as one linchpin in the long-term health of Afghanistan, corruption is the second. So yes, it's definitely a problem there. 
Uh, the next question is, uh, uh, I guess, a kind of uh, hot topic. Um, can you comment on the attack uh, of U.S. aircraft or by U.S. aircraft on a hospital in Afghanistan? Oh. This is where I look at the camera and say, public affairs, if you're watching me, <laughs> I beg mercy. Um, being a career intelligence officer, and having familiarity with how um, we select targets. Anything from one digit being input correctly to a single fin being bent slightly out of place on a GPS bomb kit is enough to cause a catastrophe. I can, sp speaking on behalf Okay, this way I will speak on the behalf of the Air Force and myself as a human being. We don't ever, ever seek to deliberately target civilians. We don't ever deliberately seek to cause unnecessary um, collateral damage. And let's, collateral damage is an unfortunate term. Let's just call it for what it is, killing people that are not supposed to be killed. Um, I don't even like to glorify killing the bad people who are trying to do bad things. Um, I like Treat, I like to treat it a little more professionally than that, but no, we, it was a sad moment. And I would say, I will say that we wouldn't have deliberately targeted a uh, civilian hospital. The next question follows up on your point about uh, the advantages of, of a longer term commitment and it just uh, asks what would you, uh, what would it take for the U.S. to uh, think uh, about a long term deployment of personnel to Afghanistan? Uh, could volunteering work, for example? Optimistically, what I, what I, what I would really hope for was if the security situation was better in Afghanistan, I think that would encourage more NGO volunteerism. I know NGOs are, have been growing more increasingly reluctant to operate in Afghanistan because the security situation is growing so increasingly deplorable. Um, long term, I, now this is where I'll speak as myself. So I, Obama asked for about 9,800 9, people to remain, uh, troops to stay in Afghanistan. I'm not sure that it will be quite enough. I don't know that we have the resources or the, um, the um, remaining well of emotional or physical resources to maintain a huge surge in Afghanistan anymore. But I do think if we, c if we can keep working on trying to improve the security situation, and I should add the whole purpose of advising the Afghan Air Force, and they have similar advisors for their Army, and their police forces is to, so they can help themselves do their own work. As security, for, there are security increases, and again, I still hope it does, and I still have faith that it does. That can encourage a little more volunteerism under safer conditions to come in Afghanistan. Hopefully, that answers the question. Oh. Why are the Taliban able to enlist and incentivize Afghanis to fight uh, while the Afghan govern government uh, cannot? Because the Taliban can offer security, and while this might be equipped, they can offer a better 401k plan than the government can. And a lot of it comes down to that. Some of it is um, religious-based. Some of it is anti-American based. But some of it is also, I need to feed my family. The Taliban is offering me a better deal. And historically, the sense of a central, sense of a central government in Afghanistan has been very remote. Uh, Afghans generally are more familiar with their local government. When I mean local, they're town hall, they're tribal leaders. So the concept, for many, many rural Afghans, the concept of uh, President Kabul is very far away. But the Taliban leader who's right here, offset hopefully by the strong non-Taliban leader right here, those are gonna appeal to the locals a lot more than the, the a central government will. So uh, the next question asks, uh, uh, how would you square America's longest war, over three times what it took to win World War II, uh, with the Powell Doctrine? I would say Powell is rolling in his grave even though he's not dead yet. Um, 
the the um this has actually crossed my mind before the united states we found ourselves in many um, nation building enterprises since the early 90s and we've gotten a lot more i guess public support for it even though i'd say state building should be the state department's responsibility unfortunately when it comes down to it as proud as i am for our work we did here and i do like the advising mission the purpose of the United States military is to go in, fight, and win our wars. It's not to build countries. So I would say, yes, we are. this doesn't square very well with the Powell Doctrine. But I have to balance that with the reality is we have the, and this is going to sound hypocritical based on what I just said, it comes down to it that the U.S. military has the resources and the capacity and the know-how to do it. I'm speaking personally, I don't know that the U.S. military should be in the long-term um, job of building countries. But if we're there, I do want to hope that we do the job right. How receptive were Afghan Air Force officers to U.S. training methods, and how competent did they prove to be after training? This is a good story. I found uh, Afghan Air Force personnel to be very, very, very competent at their jobs. Um, the time I was there, we had, um, let's see, out of how many, so many pilots. Um, a lot of them were qualified to fly in the absence of American um, advisors. We had several that were qualified to fly Americans without American support on board, because they were that trusted and that capable and that confident. Uh, their maintenance crews, they've had crews that have been maintaining helicopters since before the Soviets arrived. So they, they're very old hands, very experienced with working with this equipment. Um, so for at least from air, my, my larger concern with the Afghan Air Force is not their capacity or their capability. It's that uh, running an Air Force is expensive. So even if you did away, if, if you clean up the corruption, corruption and streamline operations, it's going to still takes a lot of money to keep those aircraft in the air. But as far as their capability, they're very, very good at what they do. Uh, the next question asks about uh, your goal of immersing yourself in the uh, Afghani culture. And, um, but noting that there, there are some aspects of that culture that uh, we would find uh, really bad, such as the low literacy for women uh, that you mentioned. Um, how does one deal with uh, immersing oneself in a culture, part of which is objectionable? Um, yeah. Good question. Um, that probably, that was the hardest thing that going into Afghanistan to deal with. How am I going to, uh, to um, interface, especially when they see that how should I say? My wife beats me every day. And I take it like a man. She says she loves it because I'm like just a big wet sack of flour. I just take it. <laughs> and they even admit that in jest in some Afghan, they're like, oh, you're less of a man. How can you let her do that? I'm like, oh, come on. You know? Um, the, uh, I was at a slight advantage, though, in that many of the Tajiks I worked with in the Afghan Air Force, they were uh, at least had high school educations several college graduates, and uh, at least one sergeant I worked with had a teaching certificate to teach early childhood education before joining the Army. So they were a little, and also they, a lot of them lived in Kabul and came from urban areas, so they were a little more sophisticated. So they were uh, more open-minded about um, how culture should be flexible and how rights could, adva could advance. I was not at the disadvantage, uh, you know, working with some of the other groups, and maybe down in Kandahar, where individuals were uh, a little more conservative. I really didn't have that experience, which um, was thankful. I should point out, though, that there were um, many attacks on personnel. You'll hear them called um, like green on blue attacks, where Afghans would turn on us. In fact, I had a friend from the Air Force Academy who was killed uh, in Kabul several years before I deployed on the base I worked at um, were not because of, of uh, like Taliban insiders but because of uh, cultural differences where a uh, Afghan would have perceived that his uh, honor had been slighted to the point that they were willing to take violence on an American. Um, I was happy that I didn't really see that. 
I found the Afghans I worked with to be very open-minded, uh, very willing to get to know me, and to the point of asking me personal questions that I was very surprised. Um, to actually asking how my wife and children were doing, which typically men don't do that. But they had established that level of trust, and it was a little more commonplace. But again, I'll have to say that my perceptions are very much uh, horse-blinded through my view of a single location in the country working with a single group with a certain education level, which I'm sure my experience would be a lot different, say, if I'd been in Herat or Kandahar or Jalalabad. Okay, I think we have time for uh, this one final question and, uh, again, kind of a, a pointed one. How would you deal with the perception that the U.S. involvement in Afghanistan has been closer to the Morgenthau-type uh, behavior uh, than the behavior you represent? That is, uh, you know, if uh, the, the motivations and behaviors of the U.S. Uh, have uh, themselves been problematic, and uh, is that something uh, that uh, you're aware of or have uh, some, uh, some ability to address? In the case of Afghanistan, going all the way back to 2001, I would say it was a case of we knew what our target was, Al-Qaeda, Osama bin Laden. We knew where, where he was operating out of, and we knew that he was able to operate freely because he was, in, again, in a failed state. I would say that uh, when President Bush decided to attack, Afghanistan, it was a decision where he knew once we went in, we had a clear objective against the target that we know would attack us, but we could not just go in and do it and just walk away from it. Because if we did that, it wouldn't have solved, it would have left Afghanistan the same um, economic sinkhole that it was before. So then the decision was made, let's go in and um, try to make should I say, Afghanistan a little more stable so this time of thing, type of thing doesn't happen again. I would say that um, more positive approach was a little tarnished by Iraq. I would say the ramifications from that are still ongoing. I think that might have um, hurt our reputation, if you will. But. And now this would go back to my earlier comment that I do think that now that we are there, we should still try to proceed to do it right and not just walk away and leave them holding the bag. Okay. I'd like to make one more comment if there are no more questions. Okay. Yeah, um, please go ahead and make one final comment. I do want to finish on a more positive note. <laughs> Public Affairs told me to please take the bullet that said pointing to the rubber chicken in the picture out. <laughs> I did in another version. And then on this version, I, I totally missed it, but I think it's worth noting the importance of this rubber chicken in the picture. <laughs> I love rubber chickens. Um, I can't remember what comedian said. I came up with this myself, and I found out another comedian said the same thing. There is no situation that is so tense anywhere that you cannot say, here's a rubber chicken, and everything gets imp improved on the spot. Just walking up and saying rubber chicken. So everywhere I go, I always have a rubber chicken with me. I always keep it bagged with a label on it. So if someone says, what is that? I can walk up to it without saying anything. I just point at it and says deluxe rubber chicken. To the point that every week at my own division at Air, at, uh, down at the 25th Air Force, whoever has performed the best in my division, we do this big brouhaha, and we shout out, he has won the chicken of the week. And he gets this individual, he or her, gets to carry on a rubber chicken with him everywhere they go. And it's a point of pride. So I just, I just love rubber chickens. So. <laughs> That's all. I guess if that is all, that's, I that's thank you for your time. Yes. yes, thank you very much. It sounds like the Afghans learned a lot about American culture out of this, too. Uh, we're very grateful to Lieutenant Colonel James Fielder for his presentation to the Iowa City Foreign Relations Council today. Uh, we, I also want to, again, thank our sponsors, University of Iowa International Programs, the University of Iowa's Honors Program, the Stanley University of Iowa Foundation Support Organization, and uh, today's uh, uh, 
Financial sponsors, Dave, Denise, and Mike Tiffany. Thank you, guys. And uh, Hayek Brown, Moreland & Smith, LLP. Now, uh, Pigeon, as a token of our thanks and gratitude for your presentation today, uh, it's my pleasure to be able to present you with a coveted Iowa City Foreign Relations Council mug. So, there you awesome. go. Thank you. Thank you. You've been a great audience. Uh, we're adjourned. <laughs>